Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. podcasts have you done four five at least six maybe so you're a seasoned vet in the podcast do my game. best yeah <laughs> i really like speaking on panels and things like that um live but podcasts uh yeah also can be nice but uh i'm in my zone when i'm in front of an audience yeah yeah you get a little bit more adrenaline a little more perked up yeah, and I enjoy it. Like you you have people in front of you, like multiple people as well, because I'm quite an extrovert and it is nice sitting in front of one person, but it's even nicer sitting in front of like 10 or 20 and <laughs> like seeing people's different reactions and seeing how you can make people feel something or, yeah. No, I totally Change agree. Their mind. It was a totally different dynamic doing this podcast with two guests. Like even it was just like now it's more of like a full on kind of round table-y conversation thing and I would love to do one one day, like an Ava Yannick style, you know, have like six, seven people around a table and mm. you're all just kind of having a chat about different topics. I think that would be so <laughs> cool. But <laughs> I think if I had seven people and I'm still only getting, you know, like 30 views per clip, <laughs> then yeah. it's not exactly the best use of resources. Also, unless they're famous people, I think it's too hard to follow whose voice is who mm. or unless they're very different people and very different voices, you know? Like if it's two or three people, you can already think like, okay, this is this person and that's that person. But I mean, if, for example, if you never listen to the radio and then you listen and they're talking about themselves or something, you're like, who's who? I don't know. Mm, good point. Um, yeah. Two or three is manageable, especially if they're different people or different accents or different uh, ages and yeah, all of that contributes. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe if I was to ever do that, then it would probably be like a video only one, not do it on Spotify and all that stuff. Just because like you say, it's unless you knew the people already, like you say, it would be <clears throat> quite difficult, I think, uh, to do that. Yeah. Um, I also like uh, kind of that that live, I don't know, audience style thing. The funny thing about this is like I still in the beginning, I don't do it as much now, but um, you can hear in every episode except for probably starting, I guess, in episode six. I'm nervous at the beginning of everyone. <laughs> my voice is yeah. a little bit like I don't know what to say. Just a little bit. Can't get it out of my throat. And um, and it, it's, it feels like it's live because I don't do a whole lot of editing. Like I don't really take, you know, stuff out yeah. or whatever. Um, so it's like anything I say can and will be used, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I just feel like even though nobody's listening now, they will be. And, and if I say something stupid, everybody will know I'm dumb. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. now I'm getting over that, luckily, because that's a tough feeling to to do. Um, but when I started the English teaching stuff, you know, like you're around, like, you know, you have a group of like 15 people hanging on your every word because you're teaching yeah. them. And that was fun, man. Like, I, I love that energy of, uh, you get funnier, you, you say, say kind of smarter things. Are you like, still English teaching though? No, I haven't, no. I haven't taught in like probably two years, I think okay. maybe. Um, yeah, long time. I missed it. I missed the, the feeling though. You wouldn't do it just like one day after work or something? No, I'm so busy now. Like, so I did have one student that, um, I had uh, his teacher moved, um, to the U S from here. And so, um, he was kind of teacherless and, um, I was kind of going through this like second wave of what am I going to do with Weaver English? Cause I'd already shut it down from the COVID stuff. We were only doing online and, the online, like, you know, profit margin was so low and it took me so much time to coordinate. And I was just kind of having like this, like a midlife crisis type deal with it. Like, what am I going to do here? And so, but I had this one student who had all these hours left. So I taught him a few lessons until he, I got him a new teacher. Um, and that was fun. But the, the problem was that because at that time I was so busy, I couldn't really fully dedicate to him what he deserved. Yeah. So like you need somebody who wants to teach, like they want to make the lesson plan. They want to grade your homework. They want to have cool like articles ready for you and videos and stuff like that. And if it was just me in that situation and I'm just kind of like teaching you the same stuff that I've taught everybody else a hundred times and not putting a lot extra into it. And I would have loved to, but I just literally did not have the time or energy to do it. So yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but I did enjoy it, you know. Um, I really enjoyed that that whole dynamic. I met so many cool and like fun people and 
so many of the friends that I have here now, especially in Rotterdam, are um, because of the English teaching. So cool. I, I wouldn't trade that time for anything. Uh, so what kind of like, you know, panels and um, live speaking events have you been doing? Mm, a little bit of everything. I've sat on a few things in terms of like sustainable fashion, quite a few for like women entrepreneurship, um, social impact. Yeah, a lot of social impact stuff actually. Um, yeah, and at universities or at events or whenever. <laughs> whenever they ask, huh? Things just appear, yep. It's kind of how it is as a, you know, starting entrepreneur, like any <laughs> chance to get some, you know, publicity or share the story, get the message yeah, out there. Yeah, it's fine, yep. And even also before um, before COVID, because I uh, was working for a nonprofit at the time and also my background is in, strategy consulting for social enterprises and having done that since 2015 is quite unique. Like it's, it's very common the past two, three years, but earlier, not so much. Mm. Um, so there was a bit of kind of expertise that I could share there at, at certain times. And, um, yeah, I hope I brought that to the speaking opportunities I've had, <laughs> but I think I, I do. I mean, it's not what I would want to do full time, but I definitely have the skill set to be a speaker. Like I enjoy the aspect of storytelling. I think I can uh, engage an audience. Um, yeah, all of these things. I think I can I can tell a story in a way that makes people feel something. What would you like to do with it ultimately? <laughs> like what would be your big dream? Like do a TED Talk or what kind of fun aspirations do you have? Mm, in life or in-, in For speaking. For speaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not many to be honest. <laughs> See where it goes. That's yeah. a good, good philosophy. So let me do the intro then. Your name is Alyssa Glory and you've instructed me to call you Liss, which is <laughs> cool because I don't know anybody that goes by Liss. So, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously you have like Liz, lots of Liz's, but uh, you're the only Liss that I know yeah. now. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and so you founded with a co-founder, Mojaware, M-O-J-A-W-E-A-R. Yeah. And the website is? Mojoware.com. Nice. Okay. So, um, yeah. And then you, you guys are doing a lot with not only, so it's a, it's an underwear brand, correct? Only underwear right now? It's a social impact underwear brand. Social impact underwear brand. And so you really focused on the sustainability factor, but also you're doing some really interesting things with the supply chain in Tanzania, correct? That's where it is. So we're going to talk all about that. Um, you're also Australian, correct? I am. So yep. for people worrying, wondering about the accent <laughs> or something, it's so funny to me how like Australians, English people, South Africans, and even Americans, a lot of the time, like non-native speakers, the way the, the guesses that they have sometimes it's like, I'll be talking to somebody and they'll say, oh, I thought you were Australian. And I'm like, what? Have you ever met an Australian? <laughs> you know, like, so yeah, but just to give the listeners hundred percent clarity, you're Australian. Yeah. How long have you been here in uh, Rotterdam? I've lived here four years now. Same as me. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. And so um, did you live anywhere else in Europe before you left Australia? Um, I did my last year of study in Sweden and then I went back to Australia and started working and then I moved here. Oh, so, okay. So wait, mm -hmm. you, you did university in Australia originally? Yeah. And then I did my last year of studies in Sweden. Okay. So you were in Sweden before you came here? Yeah. Oh, and so then after you graduated, and what did you study? When I went back to Australia to graduate, I uh, studied screen arts and marketing. So I did both arts That's and That's a cool-ass combo, uh, screen arts and marketing. Yeah. Wow. Um, Can I go back? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I really wanted to study sustainability at the time, actually, except or like social impact of some description. But I could only do that under the very intense sciences, and I didn't want to go down that path. I wanted to do something more like business, social, kind of like people interaction. So I studied what I did and then I started working in strategy consulting, but purely for social impact organizations. So uh, social enterprises, nonprofits, government projects, doing uh, innovative, impactful things. And mm. I, I loved it actually. I really did. But um, at the downturn of the mining boom in Australia, uh, a lot of the money got pulled out of these projects and I was also just kind of left thinking that I'm capable of more than I could find. Um, so I was like, why don't I just make myself uncomfortable in absolutely every single way, move city, move country, go to a place with a different language, different culture, all of that. 
and I uh, was traveling around Europe, visited a friend in Rotterdam, saw so many cool pop-up events and sustainability initiatives and the government is so involved in the city's development, which I thought was really cool. So I was like, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll stay here for a while. And now it's been four years. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. That's, I didn't think about it actually, but um, when we're probably about the same age. And when I was in university, I took one um, class that was on like sustainability and urban development. And I have to say at that time, I was very conservative, like in many, many ways. Um, however, like the, so what you said that brought this up is like, you said you couldn't study it without being in like one of the kind of harder sciences or something like that. And it was nearly, I guarantee you the options at my university and many universities now for sustainability and social impact is probably 10 times at least what it was back then, because back then it was very niche, you know, very small. And the people that were teaching my class, like, I just thought it was so left field, like insanely kind of hippie and like the stuff they were talking about. I was like, this is never going to work in the real world. Like this stuff is insane and blah, blah, blah. And to be honest with you, even now, like as socially impact minded as I am, I still think there would have been a little bit in that class where I was kind of like, I don't think this is for me. Um, But you're right. Like it's totally changed and kind of blown up in the past, you know, let's say 10 years or so. Um, and now I think there's probably way more options than even, you know, a few years ago for people who really are interested in social impact. Absolutely. And also like, even if something does seem radical, there's nothing wrong with radical thinking that will inspire some ideas and those ideas might be more practical and realistic and those ideas will create change. So it doesn't always need to be the first idea is, is the last idea. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. No. And I'm not against radical at all. <laughs> I've always yep. been pretty radical. It was just, sometimes things are just dumb and you're like, this is dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> what, uh, what got you interested in, uh, sustainability and social impact in the first place? Uh, I always did a lot of volunteer work growing up, um, as kind of part of uh, school or part of the church. Um, and I think that kind of sparked the first interest to be honest. I also remember this very Christian idea of like being stewards of creation. And I remember that like really resonating in me thinking, although now I'm, I'm absolutely not religious, but I still really like this idea that we're all here to take care of each other and take care of the earth. Mm. Um, I want to live in a, in a, in a world and in a city and in an environment that benefits everyone and that helps everyone. And I want to be part of creating a world that does that. And I want to smile every day. I want to have fun every day in what I do. And I mean, if everyone had a job where they would smile when they go to work (laughs) every day, like imagine what the world would be, you know? That's a really cool way to put it. And I actually haven't thought about that. (laughs) Yeah. Like honestly, solving climate change and solving climate crisis and creating equality and reducing injustice Like all we need is for people to absolutely love their jobs. Then it would all happen. Like that's really a key in my opinion. Mm. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice idea. It does sound a bit rosy, you know, like that it would all be fixed if everybody loved their jobs. But I think it would be a big help for sure. A big start. Um, It's interesting that you, that you say that because um, it's, I, I wish I could go back. I also was raised very religious not so religious anymore. Um, but I still consider myself a Christian, you know, and like, I still value the traditions and all that kind of stuff. Like it's part of my identity. And I do think it's important to have an identity or else you kind of get a little lost in this world. Um, so yeah, it's a part of who I am and I don't deny that. But, um, I, the, you know, when I was a kid, my dad used to always read us that quote from the Bible of like, you know, it's easier for a rich man to get through the eye of the needle of a camel than it is to, or I'm sorry, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Mm -hmm. And the the thing was always like Bill Gates, he's the rich guy. You know, we middle-class Americans, like we're normal people, you know, we're not rich. And so that's kind of how we were always taught is like, we as normal, you know, humble middle-class people, we're going to get into heaven, you know, cause we don't have, we're not these evil, greedy people, but then, um, and this is w- what I wish is it's like, I wish I could compare my liberalness over time, like go back in time and see how it was. But when I went to Senegal for the first time and I kind of saw like the situation there, um, and then I went back to the U S after that, cause what happened was I went to Senegal for a work trip with Linda hand and energize Africa. And I was there for like four days, I think. 
And then while I was in Senegal, I was actually on a beach. It was so idyllic, like nobody's there, but except for some kids, like, you know, playing football and stuff. And my dad calls me and he says that my grandpa is in the hospital, probably not going to make it. Um, so I obviously think like, I'm going to have to fly back to, you know, Texas pretty soon after I get back to Rotterdam or whatever. Um, so when I went back and I was only back for a week, but I was, my, you know, riding in my dad's truck, uh, to his house and I'm just looking and all of these incredibly green grass yards have sprinklers that are just, you know, shooting water out to keep their lawn green while you have these people in Africa who are going through droughts and literally can't feed themselves for the next three to four months because they don't have enough water to grow their crops, which is how they live, you know? And I looked at, you know, my dad, who's not wealthy by any means of the imagination, you know what I mean? Like totally as middle class as it gets. And he has so much wealth per se in this world Mm -hmm. that he can afford to just spray water on his grass to make it green. And not just him, but everybody. We should absolutely stop thinking about ourselves as like middle class. And we should stop looking to the, the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs and the whoever, you know, big tech Elon Musk's of the world, Jeff Bezos's, um, <sighs> because I mean, honestly, probably if if you have access to to internet, if you have a stable job, the likelihood is, especially if you have you know some money in the bank, you're probably in the top fifty percent. Especially if you live in in Europe or in a, a developed country, so you should. I mean, if, if you're you know if you have the money to spray your lawn every day or every few days with water to keep it green, it is your responsibility as well. And I think people also think like, yeah, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the 1%, I'm not the 2%, but I think a lot of those people are in the 10% and almost all of them are in the top 50%. So it's absolutely something they can do and there's absolutely some way they can contribute. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's obviously very complicated and it's easy to like sit here from a high horse and for me to judge people and whatever. And because another thing you notice is like, in Senegal, even there are people driving around in beautiful cars and big Mercedes. And there are people that live in, I mean, African people, not, you know, white people or whatever. Like, and then we were at this event and, um, there was like, it was a huge buffet, you know, it's like everybody that was attending the conference, you know, you just line up, go through this long table and eat whatever you want. And at the end of the day, they're like throwing all of this leftover food away, like just into the garbage can. And I remember, you know, everybody in the Netherlands, I think they say this across the world, but my great grandma, when I was a kid, if you didn't finish your food, it's there are starving children in Africa, you're finishing that food. And so, I mean, you're like, it's kind of a shocking thing when you see in Africa, they're throwing away food because you're like, don't you know, like this is where the kids are starving and they need the food. And, but it's like these problems, these systems that are creating these problems, they're, they're present everywhere. And it's, you know, it's, um, it's a little bit like sometimes you, if you have escaped something, like um, if you were really poor and then you get out of it and you get money, it, you have this like level of empathy and even sympathy for people who were like you because you understand it. But if you kept yourself in that frame of mind all the time, like with that empathy and thinking about their situation, you're never going to have anything for yourself or feel good about it or whatever, because you could just give it all away, trying to help people every single day. And and you would never fix it all. There would always be somebody else left to empathize with. And I think that's probably how those, you know, rich people in Dakar feel when they're driving their Mercedes is like, I can't help all these people. So what am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? It's so we start to detach from it. Yeah. I mean, the, there's two things here. First of all, the Africa story exists and because it exists, people often, um, condemn behavior that is normal for a, for a Western country when it takes place in Africa. For yeah. example, you said throwing the food away. Um, but we can't be angry at that. Like that happens every day here. It, it absolutely happens around the world. And, and so they're no more responsible or at fault than we are here. Um, <clears throat> but also I think um, in terms of like giving or, or sharing or impact, so many people try their whole lives to, you know, do something or work in an impactful field, whereas study shows that actually if you just go and make a shit ton of money and then give it all away, that that's probably going to have more impact than volunteering mm. like 20 hours a week, you know, and that's not a reason not to <laughs> not to do it, but it's a reason to do both, you reason know. Get rich. <laughs> I think also some people just think like, okay, if I make a lot of money and if I donate some, then I've secured my place in heaven or, I, you know, I've tried, I have the the badge 
of uh, I did something good on me. But yeah. we all need to be thinking like, is that enough? Like, don't we need both or don't we need another solution that that does something? And also in terms of giving, it is the philanthropic model and we also need to question whether that's okay. Um, there's this amazing quote by Martin Luther King, and I hope I say it right, <laughs> but he says, philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. And that's the problem we have here is like, okay, businesses can do whatever the hell they want, uh, damage whatever ecosystems, harm whatever people, and then give some money to philanthropy and they'll mop up the mess. Mm -hmm. And that is just not okay. No. No, it's a huge problem. I mean, um, that's one of the defenses now. And I hope that these old narratives uh, are dying because people are starting more and more to realize, like, I think our generation knows it's bullshit, but people who are like maybe 55, 60, still maybe even maybe 45, I don't know, maybe it doesn't even matter the age could just be your ideals or whatever. But like right now, you know, it's in the news because uh, in the U S they're trying to uh, pass this, you know, historic spending bill. That's going to be, it started off as, you know, 5 trillion, then it went down to 3.5 trillion. Now it's down to 2 trillion. And, you know, you have, um, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia who is opposing it and holding it up. And part of it is the way they want to pay for it is by taxing billionaires, you know? Um, and so the defense line that he throws out there, which is as old as time is yes, but we can't criticize these people because they create jobs. You know, they build a lot, you know, for this country and they, they donate so much in philanthropy that we can't villainize these people. But everybody who knows what's going on here realizes how much like that shifts their tax burden. Philanthropy for them is not actually even coming out of their pocket. Bill Gates is one of the most notorious tax evaders in the world because yes, the Gates Foundation does a ton of good. Um, however, it also does a lot of tax evading for him. So it's not this line that we can just keep going forever because that's great that Jeff Bezos wants to donate five you know billion dollars now to help the climate or whatever. Um, but what if he you know years ago said every Amazon truck we buy is going to be electric or every you know new factory that we produce is going to run on you know is going to be carbon neutral or something like that the growth would have been slower for sure you know so there's always this give and take like you say maybe that's kind of this excuse rich people Jay-Z said this a long time ago when he first started getting criticized for not doing more for the black community as he said the best thing I can do for the black community is get super rich and be an example for them that they can make it and everybody was like, that's the biggest cop out I've ever heard. I mean, and I think it's like what you said, it doesn't have to be in the extremes. It doesn't have to be either I get rich and do nothing. And then when I'm 50 and a billionaire, then I do something or I just don't do anything. And I just volunteer a little or whatever. Like, no, you can do both. You can get rich and still try to be responsible with it. Um, and I think that's what this kind of like, you know, social enterprises and this whole movement of like B Corps, you know, companies trying to be for-profit companies, but also ethically responsible at the same time. That's where I think this trend is hopefully heading. And, and I love to see it. Obviously your, your underwear company is, you know, like a part of that as well. So I hope things are going to get better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a small part, I think as well, people really want it now. Um, I was reading the other day, for example, in Australia, I know they're only going to reach their Paris climate targets. 90 or 80 percent of their their targets are only going to be reached because of individual action because individual people are taking up on solar and individual people are using less energy and that's the only reason we're going to reach the target and not because of government action or policy or technological um I saw investment. your post on instagram the other day calling them out <laughs> yeah like that. oh man there's, there's so much to be yeah. angry at the government <laughs> at the moment but uh yeah, I mean, people want that change and they're, they're prepared to make it, but it, it shouldn't also be this, like, wealth inequality is also just a huge problem and we shouldn't be aspiring to have as much money as Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. We should be aspiring to have what we need within our means yeah. and then to search for other methods of happiness and fulfilment. I definitely think there is such thing as too much, you know, and um, there's always been this argument of like, okay, so Bezos has like a $500 million super yacht or something like that, you know, maybe it's 50 million. I don't know, but it's a ridiculously amount of amount of money, no matter what it is. And there's always been this argument like, well, okay, but he pays for that yacht, which then pays for the workers and pays for the engineers and does this, this and that. It's like, that's true, but there's also a profit margin that another billionaire who owns the yacht company is also getting. So, and there's a lot of workers at the bottom being exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, like right now it's in the news that 
John Deere, the tractor company, their workers are on strike. You know, they on average, I think make, I don't want to misquote it, but I think it was somewhere between like 1150 and maybe 15 euros an hour or something. The CEO made, you know, like uh, 30 million or something last year. And it's like, why does he bring that much more value to the company, you know, than this entire workforce does? Absolutely not. And that's just why I don't, I'm not an anti-capitalism guy. I think capitalism can work, but it's never been the idea to just have totally unlimited, unfettered capitalism. There's so many laws in the U S against the Carnegie's and uh, JP Morgan's and people like that, that just aren't being enforced. You know, like we've known for hundreds of years that monopolies and things like that are bad, that wealth inequality is bad. That's what has broken many empires, you know? Yeah. So and what we were what we were talking about earlier is it's like it's so easy when there's a scapegoat. So like if Bill if Jeff Bezos or you know Bill Gates or Elon Musk can be the scapegoat, then Bernie Sanders driving around in a Yukon Denali that costs ninety thousand dollars gas guzzling. It's not his fault because he's not Jeff Bezos. You exactly. Know? And it's the same way. It's like if if I try to tell you know somebody like my dad that man, you really shouldn't use this, all this water because the whole earth is going to be short on water soon and we need to be conserving it and doing whatever. And it's bad for the climate, like all this kind of stuff. Like he's like, man, I got other problems. You know what I mean? Like I got bigger fish to fry. Like I'm trying to have enough money to retire. I'm trying to pay my bills. I'm trying to do this. And nobody really wants to feel like they're at fault for just kind of living their normal life. And but we should feel at fault, you know. If the, if the T-shirt on our back is made by someone in modern slavery, we should feel bad. And if the food on our plate harmed local communities because of uh, fertilizer runoff, we should feel bad. And we need to all start taking responsibility for that as well. You're right. There's a great statistic where it's something like um, uh, the average Dutch person has something like eight slaves um, if you have a smartphone and if you have you know like a robot vacuum and if you have an, all these kind of things it's like the average western european north american and probably australian has you know probably around 10 slaves or something like that working for them across the world at every you know moment because for us to buy these fast fashion clothing somebody's got to make it super cheap for us to have these electronics and made of plastic and whatever that are just going to go in a landfill and be there for forever there's consequences to all this stuff and it's all so invisible to us on purpose. People don't really want us to see this thing, just like they don't want us to see us, us to see how our food is made. Yeah. Because if we see it, we're not going to be that happy about it. If you actually saw the person who was working for, you know, just a few dollars um, to make you the, you know, sweatshop clothing that you wear, it's going to be a little harder to wear it and buy it, you know? Yeah. There are actually, by the definition of modern slavery, there are more slaves living in the world at the moment than any other time in human history. Ugh, that hurts to hear, man. That's... People don't know that. Like, it, it comes from every industry and every environment. And I mean, especially it's something we know at Moja, being in the fashion industry, which is an industry with a huge, you know, predominantly uh, women-led workforce. Um, it's something we're very aware of. And it's, it's also something like, of course, we single-handedly cannot change it. We can only try to drive change uh, within our own production lines. Oh, well, at the moment, we only have the capacity, I should say, to drive production, uh, to drive change in our own production lines. But it's something that exists everywhere. And, and if you think about that, it's like whether you care about people or the environment or yourself or your children, like everyone has to care about one of these things, right? And then- these systematic changes, it, it makes sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it is something that we, as much as I do think governments are at fault and have to change and have to be better and whatever, we also do have to be accountable. And there are things we can do. Um, because I had the conversation with you a few weeks ago that then led to this podcast and also the last guest, Valentina, um, <clears throat> she is a lot about, you know, slow food movement and food sustainability and this kind of stuff. And you know, when you have these conversations with people and you kind of have to look yourself in the mirror about your own hypocrisy, like you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't like factory farming and, oh, you know, sustainable clothing, blah, blah, blah. Like you, there are actually a lot of choices we make with our dollars and euros every single day that could affect these things. And yeah, maybe right now it's small and it's just one person. But in the last few weeks since we had that conversation, I bought some new um, hangers for my clothing and I bought, I think they're wood. Um, because that's better than plastic. You know, it's not going to sit in a landfill forever because wood will rot, you know, it will go away. Um, something else that I bought that I also bought in wood for more expensive because it's like, you know, the same exact um, thing. 
And the clothing, we've talked about this before, where it's like, I kind of started to realize that H&M, I shouldn't hate on them too bad as far as like the long lasting of the clothing. Cause I have some shirts from them that have lasted like three years and look just as good as the first time I wore them. But then I have a lot of other clothes, especially from like forever 21 and different places where it's like wear them three times. And all of a sudden I'm like, okay, this is just an around the house shirt now, you know, like I can't wear this out again because it just it fades or it stretches or whatever. And so not from the standpoint of like, slave workers or anything like that. I just started trying to, it also started with gym clothing. Cause I noticed like cheap gym clothing just goes like that. But if you actually spend a little bit more money, even if it's on sale, it's not that expensive. You buy some under armor it lasts forever. Like I noticed that I had the same pair of shorts that were under armor that I bought my freshman year of college brought all the way, you know, that was like, you know, 10 plus years ago. So I was like, okay, maybe that investment now does pays cost off. me a little bit more pays off down the line. So but all these little things, you know, I do think it's going to cost us more money out of our own pocket. Like yep. literally have to put our money where our mouths are. And if you're going to buy something, just do the research, you know, like if you want to buy something from Primark, look at their um, sustainability report in inverted commas. Um, I know recently they made the commitment to try to increase the average lifetime of their clothing, I think from three or five washes to 20 washes, which means in the beginning, the clothes were only ever designed to be worn five times. <sighs> Like that's it's insanity. That is insanity. And that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, but I think also what you said about, you know, food and, and how much we care and things like that, like people love to fight for something. They love to stand up for inequality. They love to fight for sustainability. They love to put their, put their hand up or put their voice out there and say like, that's not right until they walk into a fast fashion store, until they sit down at a restaurant, until they walk into the supermarket because then they have to put that into action. And that's where, it, that's where there's this gap. It doesn't happen. Yeah. And the reason it doesn't happen is because we can only give or we can only make a good choice when it's convenient to us. And that's what, what is really wrong with the world at the moment is that a lot of our systems are relying on convenient empathy. Yeah. So having this empathy, but only when it suits us. Yeah. It, it's hard. You know, it, it really is like, um, you know, like I was talking about, um, McDonald's earlier, you know, it's, um, the only thing I've ever really considered that much when I eat at McDonald's is the health for me. Like, should I actually do this? Like all the calories, blah, blah, blah. Like you want to make and the, the money as well. It's like, sometimes, you know, it's just convenient to go pop by there and spend eight euros when you could go home and cook or whatever. But actually after, so the first time I spoke with Valentina before doing the podcast, like we were talking about factory farming and stuff. And so I was doing a lot of research and reading. And then in these articles, they don't even like spend time talking about how bad McDonald's is because they think it's just so known. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? They just kind of off like reference, like, and of course, McDonald's is like the factory farming king of the world. And I thought, oh my God, like how in the world else could they make that many burgers, that many chicken nuggets, unless they're really packing, you know, tons of chickens into a small space and that there's these terrible things like with them um, on, on chicken farms, they, as the chicks are hatched, they, if it's a male chick, they have this grinder that's just going like a meat grinder and they just throw yeah. live chicks into the grinder and it just, they get disintegrated, you know? And I mean like, so I'm not accusing McDonald's of this cause I haven't done my research or anything, but I'm assuming if that's going on in the Netherlands at chicken farms, which is a pretty sustainable ish place compared to the rest of the world, and a place with great EU policy as well. For it looks great, and yep. that, that's what. Well, well, great in comparison to policy of of other countries sure, and definitely. other states. Much yep. better than the US, I think. Um, yeah. But it's still like it's it's again Dutch people are conscious about it, so they do a good job of trying to appease them, and they'll change some things. And then once you actually look at the standards of factory farming for chicken, for instance, like for it to be labeled as free range, all that means is that it has to have no more than eleven chickens per square meter. That's still 11 chickens in one square meter. Like that's not a lot of space, you know? Yeah. So it's like, there's a lot of these things where they're kind of, you know, marketing it to look more sustainable or whatever. Uh, but my original, you know, point about McDonald's is like now though, I feel like so guilty if I'm going to go to McDonald's because I'm like, how can I say that I'm against factory farming and I feel terrible. I don't want animals to be treated like this, but then I'm going to go feed the profits of the company that's probably driving the most factory farming demand in the world. And like you say, sometimes it's convenient and you just, man, I'm so hungry right now. I need some food. Like I know McDonald's is, is going to taste good and whatever, but yeah, it's going to take like, I think after a few times of that, eventually you'll find maybe a solution, a different place you yep. can go or whatever, but it's hard getting over that 
you know, yeah, you have the empathy, but you also have this need for food right now. And I have to be like non-selfish and it's hard to do, to do, I have to say. Yeah. I know what helps me is like labeling things in my mind as like green light, yellow light and red light. Oh, so really? for example, I mean, it makes sense with food, but also like clothing or, you know, anything else you're going to buy. I think if it's secondhand and I need it or, you know, something like that, I think, or I'm, I'm borrowing or swapping with a friend, something like that, it's green light. If I'm buying something new and it's sustainable or ethically made or, uh, you know, for example, instead of McDonald's, maybe it's a it's a salad um, or a, a vegetarian restaurant or some some kind of local fast food, then that's a yellow light. And if it's the McDonald's or if it's the, the H&M or if it's a, a big brand um, where they are contributing negatively to the world in in to your knowledge, then that's a red light. And mm. okay, the red light, sometimes you can't avoid it, but you don't want to be making a red light decision every day uh. or you know, every meal or something like that. So it's like a moderation kind of system. Yeah. Where you- and I mean, we can't all be the perfect little sustainability humans. No. <laughs> and that's the thing. We don't need the world to become vegan, but we need everyone to eat less meat. Yeah. We don't need to, you know, totally wipe out new clothing production, but we need everyone to spend less. We need every um, every clothing manufacturer to incorporate more sustainability targets and metrics and meet them in their production lines. And mm-hmm. These changes in moderation is what will <clears throat> will create sustainable change because it is sustainable. It's not extreme. It's not drastic. It's not really inconveniencing people so much. Yeah. And I want to I wanna ask you for some specific, I guess, advice here in a minute. But um, one thing that I also think um, is difficult for people is how it always seems like one thing leads to another, to another, and then you kind of have to give up because you feel like it never ends, right? So mm. as an example, um, let's say you start off, man, I eat beef every day, a couple of meals a day, whatever. And people say, oh, it's so bad for the environment because, you know, uh, the carbon emissions and the water and this and that. And you're like, um, oh, okay, well, then I'll move to chicken. Oh, you can't do chicken, man, because they're factory farming that chicken and they're grinding up the chicks and they inject them with these chemicals and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, okay, well... I'll do salmon, you know, that's we're better for the environment. It's better for me, blah, blah, blah. Oh man, you mercury can't, mercury poisoning. you can't eat salmon because you got to watch conspiracy fish. and you're going to get mercury poison and all that stuff. And you're like, uh, okay, well I'll eat avocados. Oh, you can't eat those, man. They're from Mexico. They're flowing all the way over here. It takes so much water, blah, blah, blah. Actually, if you want to make the least impact, negative impact in the world, then you can lie on the floor and breathe as little <laughs> as possible. Like, honestly, that's, that's ultimately what it comes to. And I think a lot of people have this and it, Okay, whether it's climate anxiety or impact in anxiety or health anxiety, you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, it, it it's totally there and it's totally prevalent. But uh, we don't need that anxiety if we build a world with structures and systems that protect people and protect the world. And that's something that you can fight for. It's something that you can't do lying down on the floor and breathing <laughs> as little as possible. Um, but it, yeah, it, I think it's so hard to be to be optimistic and. Um, yeah, Christina Figueres, I think her name is, she uh, was the architect of the Paris Agreement. She talks about this mm. kind of like stubborn optimism and that's that's really what the world needs, you know? Stubborn optimism. I like that. Yeah, um, yeah I, I do like that. Um, and so the reason why I, I give that thing of how the negative slope happens is because um, I do want to get to like the the tangible things that people can do as far as it goes to clothing because – when we were first talking about this a few weeks ago, I told you that I was looking into, um, you know, different materials, uh, for clothing that I was selling. And I, and so I thought, oh, you know, I've heard a lot about this recycled ocean plastic. Right. And so I thought, you know, Adidas is making and Nike, they're making shoes out of the recycled ocean plastic and blah, blah, blah. So then I I looked that up online. Of course, there's a company very well marketed, very beautiful website, and they will make you clothing out of, you know, recycled uh, ocean cotton and blah, blah, blah. And then actually on another website, I started doing some research. Like, okay, is that actually sustainable? And then they say, actually, no, that's even worse than buying the original cotton because, you know, this cotton, what happens is when you start to wash it in your washing machine, it's going to unravel or whatever. And then it goes back into the water supply. And now it's like small enough cotton that it's going to get into the fish again and blah, blah, blah. And you even had even more information about why that's, you know, not sustainable. But so that was also me going into the rabbit hole of like, every time you think you're doing something good, it's also bad. So um, what we need to do though is stop thinking about sustainability as like a be end and sorry, a be all and end all term, you know, it's 
One thing might be better in terms of water production and worse in terms of CO2. One thing might be better in terms of land use and worse in terms of plastic pollution. Um, Absolutely, recycled plastic clothing is not the answer to our challenges. Uh, Unlike recycled water bottles, for example, recycled plastic water bottles, which we can recycle again, once you put plastic into a cloth, uh, into a piece of clothing, it's almost always with current technology impossible to recycle further. So that piece of clothing will go to landfill, it will get incinerated, the plastic will leach out while you wash it into water streams and not be recovered. So that isn't, um, isn't a solution and every fabric or every material has its ups and downs. Um, natural materials are more breathable. Uh, Cotton is a great material if it is high quality and you can wear it for a long amount of time. Cotton production is quite land intensive and very water intensive. Organic cotton is even more water intensive, but a lot better in terms of um, uh, chemicals, of course, Uh, soil degradation, health of workers, everything like that. So organic cotton is a great material. Um, but at the end of the day, the best materials and and the best pieces of clothing are like already sitting in your wardrobe. Mm-hmm. I think it would take something like seven years. If, if all the clothing production in the world stopped today, it would take seven years for us to start running out of clothing <laughs> oh my God. for the, for the market, for the price of clothing to start going up because we're running out and then there'd be more demand. It would take about seven years, which is insane. We just have so much stuff. And we can all be guilty of it. You know, sometimes you think like, oh, I have this event or I I want this or, you know, trends are changing so fast. You kind of want to keep up and it's difficult, but we just need to find different ways to wear the clothes we have and to really protect them and cherish them and, you know, have that pair of gym shorts that you own for five years or 10 years or have that, you know, I still have the first pair of like kind of black pants that my mum bought me uh, when I went into my first job. And they're absolutely not ethical made, ethically <laughs> made, but they were from a very um, good quality brand and good quality fabric. And I still have them and I wear them, I think, every week. Uh, and I have done for years. You know, those are the kinds of pieces of clothing that we need to love and cherish. And we're not going to ever find that at fast fashion brands. Yeah, no, 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 definitely not. Yeah. And you were also saying that um, this I thought was interesting because you said the... The companies on the margins, like the Forever 21s and the H&Ms, but definitely Primark, they get the most attention because they're the worst normally. However, um, because of H&M, well, the attention they received, they've made a lot of changes to try to make it better. However, like in America today, who isn't on the fringe as much and doesn't get the same attention, they can kind of still slip by under the radar and doing things that are maybe not as unsustainable as H&M was or Primark for sure, but still unsustainable generally. And they don't get yeah. really the kind of pushback. And there's less pressure on them to change. H&M is actually uh, the most transparent of all of the I think big 50 or 100 uh, fashion brands are the biggest. Um, And being transparent is one thing, but if you're transparent about what's wrong in your business, that's also, you know, another thing. It doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's transparent. Um, But these things are so difficult, you know. Like I read recently that H&M changed all of their online uh, orders to paper mailers instead of plastic mailers. Now, paper mailers uh, use a lot more energy to create. Plastic is actually super carbon yeah. unintensive. Yeah. Like it was th- the first plastic bag was made to save the world because it used such little resources to be made. Anyway, H&M have switched to, to paper, which uses a lot more energy to produce, plus it's three times heavier than the plastic mailer. So the carbon output of the mailers is going to be a whole lot more than they would be if they were plastic but they've made this um, kind of like a green sustainable change, which it is in some aspects, but not in all of them. And then we come to the problem, like to what extent should we be prioritizing CO2 reduction? Because that's really what is driving the climate crisis or some of these other equitable, you know, things of, um, of plastic pollution, of chemical leaching, of water use, of, um, potential modern slavery, you know, all of these things. Like how Fish do we eating plastic bags in the ocean? How do we weigh this up? You know, like it's it's so difficult. And we just need different models that have impact built into them so that at least, you know, it's one it's one part to not be having a, a negative impact, but it's another part to be positive screening to really make sure there is a positive impact at the end of it. Yeah. Um, and that's where we can look for like look for 
That's where we can look towards uh, small brands, impactful brands, like crazy innovations. Small supply chains. Yep. Or short supply chains. Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we got to quit making these decisions in a vacuum, like you say, because we always, the politicians are the worst at this because it's whatever is trendy, whatever is the hot topic at that moment. But it's like you say, if we make, obviously carbon emissions is important, but there's so many sources of carbon emissions that we have to look at the whole thing because- yeah, let's say that you get you get mad at H&M for switching to paper and because of the carbon factor. But at the same time, a fish is not going to choke or a dolphin or whatever is not going to choke on a plastic bag in the ocean. So I would rather see this is also an interesting topic because um, I saw the CEO of DuPont. And um, of course, you know, they're going to argue for plastic and whatever. But what he says is that same thing you kind of said about how they invented the plastic bag to save the world or whatever. He said plastic is a revolutionary material that is one of the greatest discoveries in the history of the world. And he says, we don't have a plastic problem. We have a disposability problem. Like we need more commitment to the way that we dispose of these materials and to take care of it and innovation and these things and blah, blah, blah. Of course, that's easy to say when you're a billion dollar plastic company and you're making all this money, but I don't think he's wrong in a way either. You know, like plastic did change the world and all of the kind of things that we can do with it. But it's just like we shouldn't be putting it in straws. We shouldn't be, you know, doing it in with bags and things like that. And we shouldn't be, like you say, it should be built into the systems to not allow so much of it into the ocean to where it's like yeah. they say that, that you can't find a single ocean organism now that doesn't have a plastic inside of it. You know, it's is crazy. But um, if we keep. You looking, can't find an organism that doesn't have plastic <laughs> yeah. inside of it. I mean, even humans consume, I think it's like the size of a credit card a week or something from <sighs> tap water and, and other places. But um. Plastic and and any resource, whether it's plastic or it's a T-shirt or anything else, like it is something valuable and innovative and excellent and we just should cherish it. Yeah. And and I agree with, with that uh, quote you mentioned, that it's a disposability problem. The same goes for our clothes and our fast food and, and everything like that. Like if we if we cherish everything, that's a really big step. Yeah. Yeah, it's um – it's obviously going to be something that's going to be complicated to solve, but it's not going to be solved just by taking the latest shiny thing and then being like, oh, this is what I do to be sustainable. And it's the same thing with food. Like the articles I was reading and the stuff I was talking about with Valentina is like a lot of people just want to say that, oh, okay, I'll be vegan. And then that's a quick fix to sustainability with food. It's not like, yes, you, there's less, you know, emissions produced from consuming plant-based foods than there are with meat. But it's like, um, again, I should have looked this up, damn it, yesterday because I forgot it as well. But it's like whatever the metric they they measure, it's like 2.5 times whatever for the carbon emissions. It's like whatever the metric is, it's 4x for uh, chicken and it's 2.5 for almonds. And then it's like, you know, uh, f almost four for avocados and these kind of things. So it's like, and they factor all the stuff in of water use and all the different variables that go into it. But there's the point that they're trying to make is that you can't just say I'm going to go vegan and now all of a sudden my climate footprint is gone, you know, because mm -hmm. there's so many factors into that. If you're eating avocados as a meat replacement all the time and they're shipped from places where it takes tons of water to grow them, airplanes bring it over here because it has to stay fresh. Like you're not exactly helping the environment. So what their point is, like you have to think about saying sustainability in a more holistic fashion of like, and that's what Valentina said on the last episode is buy things that are in season, buy things that are in your region that are local to you, you know, stuff that doesn't have to get flown across yeah. the world to you. And yeah, but of course, politicians, it's their job to, you know, get quick votes and do things like that. So I but like these, your point. These of, quick fixes do exist. And being like, you know, transitioning to plant-based whole food diets is a really big step in terms of CO2 emissions. If you like, it, it is a step if you do it in the right way. Um, but some of these other steps can be made. Uh, for example, flying one times less a year is probably going to be just as much as that food uh, vegan plant-based change. Um, there's a few others. Transitioning to an ethical bank is also one of the biggest uh, things you can do, especially for CO2, but also for some of these other things. And we just talked about, you know, this kind of carbon tunnel vision. And um, some of these banks have really excellent screening processes where they consider carbon, but they also consider a whole lot of other metrics in terms of like waste reduction or um, people benefited or lives change, you know, these kind of things. That ethical switch is a really big one. Um, in terms of people, I know that per dollar, yeah, yeah, in terms of 
dollars spent and lives changed, the best thing we can do, uh, lives saved, sorry, is uh, invest in mosquito nets. I have one of those. <laughs> well, I don't know whether, whether, you're, <laughs> whether you're the one in need of a mosquito net, but uh, in terms of the, the diseases spread by mosquitoes and the way that impacts health and people's lives, uh, in a developing region that is struggling from, from you know, mosquito-borne diseases, that is the cheapest thing we can do to save the most lives. They just had a breakthrough uh, malaria vaccine, I think. Um, I think it uses mRNA maybe, um, which is, again, another way this mRNA stuff is changing the world. Very exciting technology. Yeah. But um, also they're using that to cure hair loss, uh, mRNA, which is funny because, um, you know, you know, the comedian Bill Burr? Maybe. <laughs> he's he's an American, <laughs> like Boston comedian. So he's like bald and super kind of out there, but um, in a funny way. But anyway, he made this joke when, when all the kind of anti-vax stuff first started. And he said, all you people saying, oh, it hasn't been around long enough. I'm going to wait and see. If they came out with a pill tomorrow that would give you a six pack, you would all be lined up, you know, down the street trying to get it without any medical trials or whatever. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how people respond to this hair loss drug that's made with mRNA. Are they going to wait and see, you know, are they going to take years and see what happens? Like, no, if you're bald and you want to get laid, you'll be jumping on that mRNA hair loss pill <laughs> immediately. So, um, but yeah, I think that malaria uh, vaccine is um, going to be pretty uh, helpful as well. Yeah. But, no. Um, and there's, I mean, there's these changes that we can make in life that are just the easier ones and we should absolutely make them if we're able to. So you uh, said before, wear, wear clothing you already have. Wear clothing you already have, eat less meat and more plants, um, switch to an ethical bank, and yeah, I think that's, oh, and fly less. Fly less. These yeah, are, so these one. are like your kind of top points of how to be more sustainable in general. Yeah. And then as far as, okay, for people who, when you are buying new clothing, um, what are some tips that you can give people as far as like um, to be as sustainable as possible um, in a general mm -hmm. sense? When you're, when you are shopping and buying clothing. Yeah. The first one is, do you need it? Like, even if it's from a secondhand store, even if it's from a friend, whatever, do you need it? Because if you start hoarding things from secondhand, you still create this kind of overabundance in your life that you will look for in other places as well. Uh, if you genuinely need something, swapping or secondhand or, you know, repurposing is absolutely the best thing. Uh, if you can't do that or you do need something new, for example, underwear is not so easily um, yep. traded on the secondhand market, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, why ever not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's actually banned secondhand underwear import in a lot of countries and actually just general secondhand clothing import has been banned in a lot of countries as well um, because there's so much of it. People mm. think that when they distribute clothing that it's going to some poor child and mostly it's being sold um, or ends up in landfill or, you know, something like this. So it's it's just about having less. Um, if you do need to buy something new, then just do some research on the brand. Do spend time, you know, getting to know the brand or familiarising yourself with the product and if you do that, you'll cherish the item so much more. Make sure the, the company does talk about sustainability and does have the information of where it's produced, who it's produced by, where the raw materials are coming from. Um, and if that meets your standards or expectations, uh, then then go for it, I think. So we should be looking for people that, you know, pay workers a living wage. Um, and then is organic cotton a good thing that we should be trying to buy? Compared to regular cotton? Yeah. So it depends on the on the piece of clothing because as you said, sometimes gym gym gear, for example, if you buy in cotton, it will it will not last yeah. the test of time. It stretches out too um, damn much. And that's the same. I mean, even with underwear, you want to be looking for about a five percent, uh, yeah, four to five percent elastin, which is which is plastic in there, and that will help it return to shape. Whereas you still with the cotton that's the ninety five percent or a mix of other fabrics, that will still give you enough breathability. Um, tensile modal are quite interesting options, although they still potentially might act because they're semi-synthetic. They're usually made of wood pulp. So either bamboo or pine, or, I mean, you can actually make these fabrics from any kind of, um, cellulose. So there's, there's companies making them out of, um, orange peels and soy waste and things like this, but they're, they're changed in such a way. So viscose was the old method and now it's tensile modal or some other things. And that, that also means a bit more closed loop production. 
uh, you still end up with a semi-synthetic material and they're not, the, the research isn't really sure how these behave once they end up into water, yeah. uh, waterways and, and waste streams. Uh, it's believed that they could absorb chemicals in the same way that plastic does and still bioaccumulate in the same way that plastic does, or at least for, for quite a few years longer uh, than cotton breaks down, for example. Uh, we do know these natural fabrics like cotton do break down. Uh, they are not harmful um, for the environment. The dyeing method is the next thing where it's transported from, the quality. I think if, if you're going to do anything as well, just look at the quality of things. Um, and, and make sure you buy things that last, even if they're not sustainably made. Sometimes the quality can be a bigger, bigger factor than the, the sustainably made. Um, so, I think I mentioned this to you as well. I bought a pair of sustainably made shoes and they didn't even last a year. Oof. And I was wondering like on what levels is this more sustainable and what it's, um, what level it's not. But there's no, uh, there's no like one magic fabric or something, you know, it's not like organic cotton is okay, it's one of the best out there, but it, it depends on the use and it depends on um, what you want to prioritize at the time as well. Yeah, I think I read that another one of the good things about organic cotton is that they don't use the pesticides and stuff on it, yep. which is then good for the environment because it doesn't get run off into the soil and rivers and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just one thing. And but, Another um, really good thing is I know that OCS covers some of it and the GOTS certifications, these are both certifications, covers even more is that it goes right back to the start of the supply chain. Mm. And some of these certifications also cover things like minimum wage and treatment of cotton growers, um, which is really great. You know, where can we, we find that on the label of the clothing or companies? Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. OTS or what was the other one? GOTS. GOTS. And OCS is also quite good. And so you can look on the label on a shirt and or something and that. see. Yep. All right. There's a few other certifications you see around, like Better Cotton Initiative is one of them. But in my opinion, that's not far enough. Like it's still very chemical heavy. It's just they they take some action. Um, but organic cotton is uh is the best. I mean, it's very it's very much in high demand at the moment, so it can be a little pricier as well. And the the price for for producers is going up and up and down. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's, it makes such a big difference in terms of the soil and and farming and people's health. Um, but yeah, for example, this is uh, a little bit irrelevant, but if it's still relevant or just a different topic, when I was in India, I was in some tea fields, and the whole week I was just feeling really shitty. Like every time I walked anywhere, I would get a little bit uh, exhausted and I had a headache and my eyes were like dry, but also watering and I just didn't feel good. And one day we drove up to a, um, a tea farm and it was the highest altitude tea farm in the world. It was in Kerala in India. Mm. I can't remember its name. And all of a sudden, like this day, I just felt so much better. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever it was, it's passed. Maybe Maybe I just had a, a sickness of some description. And later that day we came back down the mountain and back to where we were staying and I started feeling these symptoms coming back. And then it it hit me that this tea farm we went to was an organic one. The so, upper one. Yeah. So ah. all of these reactions that I was having were probably from the pesticides. And I also thought I never saw anyone spraying anything. I never was in close contact with it. I'm also not standing there picking tea leaves. So imagine the conditions for the workers who are amongst these tea fields every day. Like what is that doing to their health and what is it doing to the local environment and for the people spraying these chemicals? Like what is their life expectancy, you know? And, and we need to think about that in every aspect. Like whatever's growing, if you don't care about the environment so much or if you're not as passionate about it, then think about the people. Absolutely. This, um. And not just people far, far away. Um, there's so much scientific data now that's coming out about the effects of the pesticides and the chemicals that's um, in in Europe, strongly in Europe and also in the United States, um, that it's leading to drastically lower sperm counts in men, reductions in penis sizes overall. Um, these are things that like every male should care about. Also <laughs> women, I guess, you know, you have your own motivations for that. But if that's the stuff that they're just now being able to prove, um, what else is out there that they still haven't, you know, found? And this is not like crackpot type 
scientists. This is reputable, replicated over and over and over, you know, big time, big names in science trying to sound the alarm on this. Like, guys, we really got to shut down some of these chemicals that we're using because some of them have already stopped, but there's still chemicals that are being used. That's not even, you know, people in India that you'll never see who are making your clothes. Oh, who cares if they die early? I'll never see that person. Like, it's not just, you know, like people that you'll never see as much as they also matter just as much as the people that you will see. Like, we need to really start taking seriously the chemicals that we're allowing be used in all of these processes because even if it's not being used on your food like with cotton it's still getting into the soil it's still getting into rivers it's still still sitting next to your skin and for underwear that's an even bigger you know question like do you want these chemicals so close to your reproductive organs you know as well let's talk about that how did you uh how did you get into the underwear game Oh man, I never imagined myself working in the underwear game or the fashion <laughs> uh, industry as well. Um, so I, I think I mentioned I was working in, in strategy consulting for social impact organizations. I moved to Rotterdam and I started working in uh, marketing consulting again for social enterprises and um, then led a nonprofit and then I uh, they had some money problems. So I was like, what do I do? I want to do a bit of everything. So I thought the best way to do that would be to freelance for a while until I found my my place. Your calling in life. My calling. <laughs> well, at least the calling for the next uh, next period of time. Uh, and I was working on a freelance project and uh, my co-founder Tom was also working on that project and we got talking. And a few years earlier, he had been to Tanzania and noticed that a lot of kids weren't wearing underwear. And so he started a, a project to uh, to kind of, yeah, help with that. Uh, and we talked and just kind of like had this vision for something bigger. Um, obviously underwear is uh, wearing no underwear or dirty underwear has its own risks, uh, like increased chance of disease and infection, social isolation. Um, for girls, that's even more. Um, even things like sexual dysfunction from some of these diseases. What's the definition of dirty underwear in this uh, instance? That you've worn more than one day. Really? I'm say. Oh, yeah. man. So imagine if you don't have the resources, you might own two pairs of underwear, <laughs> like period. Um, and that is that, that plays a big part on, on your health, mm. actually. Um, for, for people then who experience menstruation, they're not going to go to school probably during their period. And during this time of menstruation, it, it might not be that they just don't go to school. They might not even leave bed. Mm. And that is a huge missed opportunity for a, a community and a society at whole that potentially a girl is uh, missing 25% of her education. And what does that do for the gender gap? And yeah, right. what does that do for taboo and all of these kind of things? Um, but also in, in thinking about um, – something we could do to change that. We, of course, wanted a local approach, but we also thought like there are people out there wearing T-shirts that have like women's empowerment slogans on them that are made in slavery and how is that empowering women? So we wanted a really kind of complete approach and then we uh, we founded Moja. So it's a social impact underwear brand. Uh, we sell underwear throughout Europe. And we also uh, train women in Tanzania in sewing and entrepreneurship. They produce underwear and reusable sanitary pads, and those products are distributed at local schools alongside a series of health and hygiene workshops. So what we've really tried to do is like create a local economy, like kind of a little micro economy of demand and supply, and make sure that everything is totally locally run so that if we disappear tomorrow, uh, the impact doesn't disappear with it. That's very cool. I was just talking to um, uh, Merlion two episodes ago because he's launching a uh, startup in Nairobi right now. Um, And um, we were just talking about kind of how like it's very common for European and North American companies to do this kind of, you know, post-colonial thing where it's like it all depends on you and your money and your resources. And then if you're gone, it's over, you know, like there's nothing left for the people. So but it's the white savior model as well. It and is. it relies on the the white people always being there or, you know, really that they are the savior. Yeah. I think it's great that you're already, you know, trying to make sure that your company is not like that. Yeah. So you chose not to go the whole get rich and then just give it all away later route. No, no, I'm absolutely uh, 
not getting rich yet. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me more it about doesn't bother the, me. I want just what? It doesn't bother me. I have the means to, to oh, live. Yeah. I am, I'm super happy. That's enough. You seem happy every time yeah. I see you. That's nice. Uh, but so specifically on the, okay, because I want to make sure that I understand this fully. The women who you hire in Tanzania to make the underwear that eventually gets sold in Europe, you train them on. No. So we have, we have two different products. We have underwear that's sold in Europe and that's made in Europe. Oh, At okay. the moment that's made in Portugal. Uh, that's a with, pretty sustainable place for clothing I've read. It is. Yep. Um, the cotton is sourced from Turkey, um, and then it's it's all shipped to the Netherlands overland, and we we send it out here. Uh, and then with part of the revenue, we send it to Tanzania, and that pays uh, the wage of women um, who are trained in sewing and entrepreneurship. And they have, in addition to being women, they have some usually some other distance to the labor force. Uh, so this really helps them. For example, one of the the women that's in our sewing team is in her 30s and last year she opened her first ever bank account. Uh, she also fixed her roof and bought a mattress to sleep on. So the, the impact that makes on her life is really incredible. Um, so they um, make these products that then, like you said, the underwear and the uh, pads, what was it? Yeah, the reusable pads, reusable sanitary pads. Sanitary pads, as you said. Yeah. And so then those get distributed for free in there in Tanzania or yep. and you pay for all that. Mojo so, Wear pays for all that. Yeah. So we pay for the materials and the production. And then the local Moja team goes around to schools, has a series of health and hygiene workshops and distributes the products along alongside of that. Uh we also sometimes get the question of like why do you uh give products out for free? And actually, like I was given free menstruation products in my school. Many people are. Many yep. societies now just provide them free in schools or universities. Or gotta make it less taboo so too. Everyone, you know? yeah, you yeah, gotta make exactly. it more mainstream. To, yeah. yeah, and so, so why wouldn't we? Especially when it's alongside education, because then we educate boys and girls to lower this taboo, to make it something we can talk about, and to make sure you use the products in the right way. Um, and yeah, we are we're starting to kind of monitor school attendance and things like that, but we we do really believe that it will make a, a very big difference. So purely from the profits that you make in the European business, you pay for all this. So basically your your customers are financing in a no, obviously a knowledgeable way, like they know about it. Um you're transparently saying this is how the profit spent, blah, blah, blah. And then that's what it directly goes to. And so you've yeah. kind of created this sustainable model to where people in Europe who have enough money and care about this can buy your underwear, which is also made in a sustainable way and will last for a long time, whatever, but then also fund this social impact project in Tanzania. Yep. That is so awesome. So the, the impacts ingrained, and I'm going to correct you on one thing. It's Please not do. For us, it's not the profit, it's the revenue. And there's a very ah. big difference because some people say like, oh, you know, I give hundred percent of profits or I give 10% of profits or whatever. But if you make a bunch of money and then you decide to to pay your team a wage of a of million dollars per person or a million euros per person, then you end up with almost no profit. But if it's revenue, it's an inbuilt part of of every purchase. It's a cost of doing business. For so you. whether whether we make a profit or not, that money will go towards that project if you buy uh, a pair of underwear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mean, um, I totally understand what you mean and yeah. I'm glad that you corrected me, but I guess what I'm, um, referencing is like, so the markup, for example, on the underwear that you sell people, right? You have a raw cost, let's say purely on the inventory and the production that doesn't include the Tanzanian aspect. Right. Yeah. And so then whatever the end consumer pays, there is a markup on that. Right. And so a part of that markup, is paying for the impact. the impact in Tanzania. But what you're saying is it's basically like, I guess it's just kind of how you figure it, right? Because you could theoretically say, yes, we spend part of our profits to, you know, go back to Tanzania or whatever. But then what you're saying is you, you tr make it a built-in cost of doing business to say a part of us producing these is also that we have to pay for this first. It's not like if we have money left over, yeah. it's like, no, we can't sell underwear unless it's profitable enough with this built in. Yeah. Interesting. And we're very transparent on these numbers. If you head to our website, mojoware.com, there's an impact page and we have a little graph which shows the breakdown of what a pair of underwear costs. I think it's it's built on a three pack. 
what that costs, what the production, what the tax, what the packaging, what each uh, level of these costs are. How did you um, come to this kind of idea or model? Like, did you have an inspiration, somebody that you knew that was doing something like this? Because it's pretty unique, I have to say, in this particular way. Mm, I think we saw some of the damages of the one-for-one models. Um, like I know Tom's shoes did it quite uh, mm. quite a lot. And you also see like, yeah, give one, buy one, give one kind of thing out there. Um, from my experience, they're very dangerous models because they dump products on communities, which communities don't always need or want. They can ruin local economies, which is another reason why a lot of secondhand clothing import is banned in a lot of countries because they have the local sewers who are trained and skilled and they would end up losing their jobs. Ah. Um, so we kind of thought like, how do we get the benefits of these one for one models without all of the problems that come along with them? Because in my opinion, they can sometimes be more problem than than benefit. Um, and how do we ingrain impact into business that we didn't want this, this business and philanthropy model? I mean, we still in our business structure do have a a business and a nonprofit, um, because it, it, it makes it easier for us. You tax of it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, a little bit of it is, is tax and the benefits there, but also um, we promise this amount of money, which can support the ongoing uh, aspect of the projects, but it, mm-hmm. it can't support a whole new project set up. Um, and we're very transparent about that because we do, we do promise that if a three pack is, is made, for example, that three products will be distributed in Tanzania. If we want to set up a new product somewhere, that might require research. It might require a few sewing machines. It might require, you know, something else. And if we're a nonprofit, we can apply for additional funding for that. Plus, if the business is not doing well, we can still keep the the nonprofit alive. So mm. we have this sustainability oh, very um, smart, in terms very of long term sustainability for that to happen. And what do you mean yeah. specifically by entrepreneurship training that they receive? So in addition to making products for us, we like to treat that as kind of like we're one client of the potential clients they they could have. We also run a few community forums uh, where we talk about um, health and hygiene, but to anyone that wants to come, not excluding, uh, not only exclusive to to children. And there, uh, women also have the opportunity to sell the products they've made. Mm. So if they can do that direct to other people or in other ways, or to other nonprofits, or to other initiatives, or maybe it's just the the sewing skills that they have. They learn to, you know, price their products and and sell them elsewhere. That creates a livelihood for them. This is all so cool, and I don't. I'm really not just saying that because um, there is so much impact washing going on in the world, so much green washing, and I think. This is again, one of those people think it's a slippery slope thing with like the, you can't eat beef, can't eat salmon, can't eat anything, lay on the floor, don't breathe, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so when you look at a thing like a Tom's and sometimes like I remember seeing on Shark Tank, there were a couple of um, companies that come on and they're like, oh, we have these backpacks and they're made in, you know, Nairobi. And then we pay the artisans this much and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they sell them for like 90 bucks in the US, you know, the profit margins fat, the entrepreneurs are making money, the investors are making money, but you're still actually exploiting the people in, you can call it microfinance or whatever, but you're still exploiting cheap labor for these people to make this thing. And then you sell it to rich white people and then you keep, you know, most of the money. So it's the same thing with like a Tom's type deal. I'm not calling them out cause I don't, I don't have the expertise like you do to be able to call them out. But, um, if you're making something really cheap. And you're just going to, you know, give one away and maybe they don't last long or whatever kind of a product it is. But the whole thing is like, oh, we're going to give one away to people in Africa. And that's the white savior model again as well. We're going to give it to India because we're these benevolent white saviors, whatever. That's still a fucked up model. You know what I mean? Like you're still exploiting people. And now what you're doing, what's even worse with that is you're using this image of your white saviorness. You're using this fact that these people are marginalized to sell your product. Mm-hmm. So now you're playing on that empathy and all you're really doing them is giving a cheap, giving them a cheap piece of fabric, Yep. you know, which is, which is really not, it's impact washing. Absolutely. And people have been able to get, kind of get away with it for a while because they're the first ones maybe doing it. And like we said, 10 years ago, impact wasn't nearly as prevalent kind of as it is today. And so I love what you guys are doing because it's so well thought out. It's so actually impactful. Um, yeah, I think it's just a really cool initiative and, I'm really into these companies, you know, that are able to like have social impact kind of like at their core and then still be a profitable company because I think that's the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, I hope so too. We're profitable at the moment, but we're not uh, paying ourselves a full wage. So we do hope, we do we do know the numbers and the scale we need to achieve that for it to be possible, but it absolutely is possible. And what are you kind of, um, you know, I don't know if this is a difficult question or not, but it's like, what are your kind of future plans for it? How would you like to see it develop? What would you like to continue doing? I would hope that Moja becomes like the basics impact brand um, in Europe and hopefully one day in the world. But also I hope that our business model is a um, inspiration or a lesson or, or something for other brands to say like, hey, is it enough what we're doing? Should we be doing better? And just because we're not doing anything bad doesn't mean we can't do something good as well. Um, I mean, if, if we have this kind of thinking in every business, I think that will, that will go a huge way into making sure we have a just, equitable, you know, awesome world. Mm -hmm. And what kind of challenges are you guys uh, facing now? Uh, at the moment, scalability, we're in the middle of a, a funding round and we just have like very small marketing budgets and what we do with them is quite incredible. But if we were to really bump that up, I think we'd have a, a, a yeah, a really great growth tra trajectory. And that also includes the impact growth as well. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's not like a, a challenge challenge, but it's something we, uh, face with solving every day is to really get the word out there and, and grow uh, as well. That's amazing. And then, so, I mean, obviously getting the word out, you're here doing that right now. <laughs> um, is there anything besides, obviously people can go to your website, mojoware.com and order underwear from you, things like that. But is there anything else that people can do if they're listening or watching to support you guys, help you out? Yeah. Follow us on Instagram. Say hi, send a message, engage, join the community. And we share a lot of kind of education and, um, kind of interesting things about health hygiene, sustainability, and all of this, uh, through those platforms as well. Nice. I want to ask you a couple of things now that we're, um, off the, cause obviously you're successful. And like you say, you're not paying yourselves wages yet, but I think that's always the next step, you know, you're doing the smart thing, like every struggling entrepreneur does mm -hmm. in the beginning. But, um, one thing I always kind of ask people on this podcast is I kind of want to talk about any resistance you encountered when you were trying to start your own business or, you know, become kind of free per se, um, go the entrepreneurship route. Because uh, I think that's one of the things is I even clarified two episodes ago. It's not that I'm trying to promote the idea that anybody can be an entrepreneur because it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to do it. Um, but I do think there are a lot of people out there that want it but just are scared or they, um, you kind of hit this, um, this thing and you, and you want to quit and it stops you. And a lot of people kind of give into that. So did you encounter moments like that? Um, and how did you deal with them? For me, there's been so many moments in my life that I've encountered resistance or, or, you know, struggled with. And sometimes it's making my voice heard because I'm, uh, younger or because I'm a woman or, you know, whatever way, uh, people do that. But I, I also think because of that, the best entrepreneurs are the people from maybe minority backgrounds or things like that, because they're used to going against the grain. So I think if it's something you want to do, just start being entrepreneurial in other aspects of your life and see how it goes. Uh, start, you know, really not doing something because other people are doing it, but doing it for yourself. And if you can manage that and if you can handle it and better yet, if you thrive from that, then you're absolutely in the place to, to do something of your own. That's good advice. What, um, what was kind of the most common thing for you? Like, did you have any like self-talk, like the negative, uh, doubting yourself, these kind of things? Yeah, I do. But I still also, do, still do, yeah. yeah, I still do. It's, it's present tense. And sometimes you think like, oh, you know, will this, will this work? Is it good enough? Um, like, why am I here? I'm not as, as intelligent or educated or, or thoughtful as, as other people. Um, but also I think I've, um, curated my environment and friendship group and <laughs> everything like this with people who are, uh, smarter than me or more experienced than me or older than me or, you know, wiser than me. And so it's also a bit of my uh, own doing. <laughs> Good for you though, that um, you have to do that, I think, to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I'm really proud of that as well, but, but there's, there's always doubts. Um, I have an incredibly strong sense of will uh, and sometimes that's a little bit too strong. Um, but I think just kind of sticking to your story and 
reflecting and being mindful of like, why am I here? What do I want to do? What's the story? Um, if I'm having a, a bad day at work, I sometimes just go and look at videos of when we were in Tanzania last and, you know, things like this. And that's really why, why we're doing this. Um, so yeah, know your story and stick to it. So you have these like solid kind of tangible things that you fall back on as a reminder of this is what I'm, why I'm doing it. This is my kind of why. Yep. Yeah. Curate your, your reason why and curate your environment around you to support you. Cause sometimes also I'm, I'm like, yeah, is this, is this working? Is it okay? And then I have a conversation with someone like you or, you know, someone in an event or something like that. And they say like, yeah, that's really cool. And then I stop and think, yeah, yeah, it is pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) It was a pretty cool day today. (laughs) That's great. I think that's, that really is wonderful because, um, What's kind of gotten me back on this, you know, realigned my focus on it is um, the guy who just won Mr. Olympia for the third year in a row. His name's uh, Chris Bumstead. And in his acceptance speech, he was talking about how um, it was like a few months ago and the kind of lead up when it starts to get ramp up to the competition. Sorry, what is Mr. Olympia? Oh, it's the world um, world bodybuilding competition. Oh, okay. where it's like it's yeah. the most prestigious one where so like they have different categories. This guy's in the classic physique category. And basically, like if you win this, you're the like best bodybuilder in the world in this um, thing. And so Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, won it, I think, like seven years in a row or something like that. Um, you know, back in the day. So it's kind of like the most famous bodybuilders ever. Like this is like your, uh, you know, Super Bowl, World Cup kind of deal. Um, and he, this guy, Chris Bump said, he's a super nice, like charismatic guy. He has a lisp that he kind of like totally leans into. Like he makes t-shirts with the lisp and the kind of word, you know. Um, but he he like does all this YouTube stuff. And um, he was talking about how one day that a few months before the competition, and like, think about this as well. Like he's just won it two years in a row. He's already on the top of the world. Um, <clears throat> almost at this point had a million subscribers on YouTube. Like should by all means feel like a success. Right. And, um, he said that he was being just really kind of irritable and, and moody and like his girlfriend kind of called him out on it. And she was like, you're not being yourself. Like you're not actually acting like you, you know what I mean? And he just broke down like bawling, like just like crying his eyes out. And he said, I'm so like, I just don't, I want to quit. I don't think I can do it anymore. Like, I don't even know if I love bodybuilding and like a blah, 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 like all this stuff. And he said, he realized like he had just kind of been compartmentalizing all this stuff and not really allowing himself to feel. Um, and then really getting all that out helped. And so then he said like the night that he, uh, the night before he, uh, competed in the Olympia and then eventually won it for the third time in a row, he had another crying breakdown episode, but he said this time it was, because I made it through that moment three months ago and all the weeks before it, where I just felt like all I wanted to do was quit. And now I'm here at this point and I didn't quit and I've, I've done it. Like I'm so proud of myself. And so in his acceptance speech, he told that story. And then he said, so to anybody, any of you guys out there that are trying to do something different or cool or unique, he was like, just don't quit. You know, he's like, it's totally normal to have like all that stuff inside your head. That's telling you negative things and telling you bad things or whatever. But they were like, if you, if you're not wanting to quit, if you're not having that negativity, you're not trying to do something hard enough or cool enough or whatever. And all of us, you know, it's like, um, you know, we're relative nobodies out here compared to like the Jeff Bezos and all these kind of people, but we are trying to do cool things and have our own freedom. And, you know, like you're doing something that's totally different from what every other, you know, fashion brand that I know of is, is kind of doing. So, but I think everybody that I meet and also I'm relying two episodes ago, it was like once he sold his business, you know, for a lot of money and should feel super successful and whatever. It's like he said, I realized I felt exactly the same as I did when I was a student. Mm. So the success never actually comes to a point where now all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, I'm, I am a great person. I'm not a fraud. I'm not an imposter. Yeah. And that's so difficult, I think, for people to to deal with in the in the beginning, for sure, like. The negative voices, like the, this this negative part in you that, that wants to sabotage your life, it will be there. Like whether you're going to the supermarket or whether you're running a business, Ooh, it will exist. that's interesting. I haven't thought about that. And I think also like that's the test, like if you're stronger than it. Um, and Seth Godin also has a really wonderful book called The Dip. It's a super tiny book. Love very, Seth Godin. Very good weekend read. And it's uh, basically the idea of it is like you should either quit now <laughs> or never. Um, because everything good, you have to go through the dip to get to the other side and it's just going to take work and it, it's going to be tough. And that's the point of it. And also sometimes, you know, we do have dips 
And that's the thing as well. Like the journey is not a linear line. It's, it's a yeah, yeah, squiggly yeah. Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And if you are in a dip, you can look at the past, you know, bad moment, bad moments or challenging moments of life and you got through them. And that's like, that's a real big test to your resilience. And yeah, that's why you can go forward. And you, you do build on those, like even, um, you know, psychologically, like it's been proven that basically if you continue to, like, if you have an addiction or something like that, let's say that you have a really sweet tooth or whatever. And it's like, every time you say no to that candy bar, it gets a little bit easier because it, you get a little bit stronger every single time. So every time you overcome a challenge in business, whatever it is, like you do get stronger from that, you know, every time, which is very, you know, helpful in that yeah. journey that you're talking about of the ups and the downs. Yeah, absolutely. And just like also be kind to yourself. I think most people speak to themselves like if if you ever spoke to someone else the way you speak to yourself, like you would, that's the meanest thing you can say to someone, yeah, you know, true. sometimes. And you just need to think like, okay, if, you know, what would I say to someone else if they were going through this and say it to yourself, you know, just Some, tell yourself sometimes that you're proud of yourself or that you're awesome or, you know, whatever you need to hear, <laughs> because you probably are, you're just forgetting it at that time. Good point. Yeah. Like self-compassion, gratitude, all those things that they talk about. Um, I heard somebody say that quote where it was like, um, there's two great quotes that I've heard related to this. One is something like, if someone else was talking to you the way that you're talking to yourself, would you keep hanging out with that person? Mm. And then that's something you kind of use that. And, oh, wow. Fuck. Why am I talking to myself in such a horrible way? Like I've got to stop. And you kind of try to, at least in that moment, shut it down. Yeah. And then another one was, um, this is totally unrelated, but related. It's um, if you're on a, it's something like the third date test. Like if you're out with someone like a, a romantic, you know, like on a date or whatever, and you think to yourself, if this was a third date and they were treating me this way, would I accept it? Mm. Or would I have a fourth date? You know what I mean? And that's also kind of a barometer of sometimes you've been with somebody for a year or two or more and they're not really treating you in a way that is okay with you. But because you don't want to ruin the whole relationship or cause bigger problems or something, you just, okay, I'm going to let that slide. But that's when that rule comes into play is it's the same thing with your red light thing. And you're kind of having systemized, like structured things for these decisions and whatever. And you're kind of check-ins on you go back and look at the Tanzania videos to remind yourself, you ask yourself, if this was a third date, would I tolerate this? And if the answer is no, you should talk to that person and say, listen, this isn't cool with me, like the way that you're treating yeah. me or something like that. Um, but it's hard to take care of yourself and look out for yourself. I think for me, it is at least, I think maybe for a lot of people as well, but. Yeah, it is absolutely. But it's something that we need to do and something that we can only get better at with practice. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. Mojoware.com on Instagram. The username is. Mojoware. Just that. Nice. Yep. You lucky dog. It's always so hard on Instagram, it seems, to get the actual name. So. It is. We would have just loved Mojo, but that was a, that was a very challenging one. Mm. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Well, everyone. everybody, please make sure um, go check out everything that they're doing. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast and, uh, and just taking the time, sharing your story. I know that it's not always like easy to share the stuff of like the internal struggles and the mental things. So thank you so much for coming on and doing that. No worries. There's many things in this discussion that we should all talk about more, whether that's uh, impact or sustainability or uh, mental health or, you know, uh, health and hygiene, menstrual health. We should all always just be open to have a chat. So uh, I totally, thanks. I totally agree with you. No, thank you for sure. I also want to shout out Studio Bang Bang because they gave me this jersey uh, for free a couple of weeks ago. But um, they're a um, production company slash, I guess, kind of um, ad agency, creative ad agency here based in Rotterdam. They just made the TV commercial for Linda Hand. We've been spending a couple of months on it and it'll come out um, in December. So they gave me this shirt just because they're incredibly nice, like humans over there. So I just wanted to wear it and tell them and shout them out. And uh, that's it. They didn't pay me for this. It's not an ad. So uh, I'm still not corporate. Don't worry. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for watching, listening, um, subscribe, like all those good things. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.